So what are the Acts 14, 21 to 23? I think we should all read this, get this thing clear in our uh, mind. If we go through all of these scriptures, if you have not gone through, okay, let me ask you something. Honestly, how many of us have gone through the scriptures? All right. I think that's a good number of you. Somebody left also. Scripture okay. is easy. The article is difficult. <laughs> all right. So what was all these scriptures? What were they talking about? There seems to be one repeating word. Yeah, establishing the church. Strengthening. Establishing. Strengthening was a key word. And that in many other translations, it's called establishing. Okay. So if you if you are able to get the biblical theology, then we will not uh, work with it. But what we saw was that uh, what we saw was that um, Paul was so particular that not only just he planted the church, but he was very, very particular about also establishing them that he would go back to them again and again he would go back to them and continue to teach them uh, put elders over them so there was a there was this very strong fo focus for paul to see that the churches are strengthened or that they are established any comments any thoughts that we can we can uh, work with Any thoughts from our, we are a church planting network, so you should have had a lot of ideas and thoughts at this couple of scriptures that we have. Yeah, one thing I noticed is Paul, especially Romans 1, 8 through 15, and even many other, other places, Paul is, is uh, mentioning that even though I can't meet you personally, I'm uh, persistently, you know, continuously praying for you, always in my prayer, without ceasing, you know. And um, as a, a pastor or as a, you know, the leader of any leaders of the church, I think that's very important. The more and more we pray and we will have more understanding and uh, um, the spirit of God will work even though we can meet personally um the spirit of god work in those people and um, we can see deliverance and things are moving faster let me read for you romans 1 8 onwards first i thank my god through jesus christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world for god is my witness whom i serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son that without ceasing i mention of you mention you always in my prayers asking for that somehow uh, by god's will i may now at last succeed in coming to you for i well now he tells why for i long to see you that i may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you that's the key word that's a key uh, thing there strengthen you that um strengthen you that is that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, by yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far we have been prevented in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to the Greeks and the barbarians, uh, both to the wise and the so I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. You can see the whole uh, Rome, Rome uh, the church at Rome was not a direct a plant of uh, Apostle Paul. But Apostle Paul had some, um, I mean, probably it was established by Aquila and Priscilla because they were disciples of, I mean, Paul had uh, probably led them or even discipled them. So there is like, a, he was, he had a, uh, though he did not have a personal relationship, but he had some kind of a relationship. And he says, I long to come to you. I long to come and be with you uh, for a specific reason that I may impart to you something what does that impart to you some uh, spiritual gift to strengthen you that 
we may be mutually encouraged. So that was the key uh, verse. And uh, Romans 16, if you read, Uh, verse 26, 25 onwards. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel. Again, the concept of strengthening is coming. Uh, and uh, both of these, in both these situations, he's addressing a community. He's addressing not an individual. Okay. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the relevant mystery that um, the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of eternal God, God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. Again, the whole uh, concept is for Paul, the focus was establishing. Paul was so, uh, you know, I would say, I like the word hellbent, but you know, he, he was really, uh, for him, it was a priority. And you will see that as we go through this course, how much that priority is, you know, to such an extent, he prioritized this over any new doors of ministry opening, okay? If there was a new door of ministry opening to a church that is in trouble or the church that needed help, he would leave this opportunity and go to establish the church. So uh, in this whole course, we are looking at how do we establish the church. In the in Acts, we talked talked about how we plan the church. Okay, uh, we will do uh, a, a few more verses. We will do before we go to the article. First uh, Thessalonians three one to thirteen. First Thessalonians. Because you will have to use these uh, verses and develop your biblical theology in your uh, first uh, competency, okay? Uh, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We give thanks to you always for all of you constantly mentioning you in our prayers as uh, Brother Subhar said, prayer. Remembering before our God and Father your work of faith, your labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by we know, brothers, loved by God, that He has chosen you because of our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in the power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. And we became and you became imitators of us and of the Lord, and for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only what has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned from God from Turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Can you can you see the concept of establishing here? Right, I think uh, in verse 13 it says, may he strengthen you. That's his prayer. Also, uh, we not see that he was so concerned about them. And since he could not go, he sends Timothy to, to see that they are still strengthened. And they are, mm -hmm. they are not lost. So who is carrying this letter to Thessalonians? I think the one before, maybe we are missing a letter, right? Before First Thessalonians. Because this is First Thessalonians, where it's a where he's mentioning that Timothy was sent earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe when Timothy was sent, we lost. We don't have that. Mm -hmm. And then this is the second letter. Possible, yes. And then in this letter, he's in verse six. He says Timothy now has come back, mm -hmm. and uh, he is telling, uh, informing the good news that you are steadfast in faith and love. 
Hmm? So what did he, what did Paul do? Why did Paul write First Thessalonians? If you have an idea, I mean, of course, I know they probably wouldn't have had a time to read all that. But why did Paul write the First uh, Thessalonians, the letter to the Thessalonians? To see that they had established in the gospel. Exactly, because if you see the, the the episode in the book of Acts, he couldn't spend time there. I think he was only there for three, four weeks or something like that, and he had to leave because of severe persecution. If you go to the book of Acts and see the record of what happened in Thessalonica. So he feels very guilty. Paul has this tremendous uh, guilt kind of a feeling where he feels that he didn't sufficiently spend time there. And, whether, and, 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 and the thing was, he sent Timothy back there to find out what? Whether they are still in the faith or not. Faith or not. That means, so he, the idea of establishing was that Paul was very, very affected by the fact that he couldn't spend sufficient time there. And therefore, Paul is sending back Timothy to help them establish, see that they are grounded in the gospel. And um, this is perhaps one of the oldest, uh, the oldest record, uh, Pauline record. And so you can see that his focus is on the gospel. Because of our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power with full conviction that that concept of uh, you know establishing in the gospel is what we are seeing here also if i remember rightly uh, first thessalonians is where paul says that i was a father to you mother to you like he was showing that as a father mother he took care like like their own family uh, the church He's very affectionate to them because he had a very slight relationship with them. So in his uh, hortatory or what we call his exhortations are very powerfully, very binding. Now, in, in verse 2, we give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith, your labor of love and the steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. That means to say, what I mean, what he's trying to say is Thessalonians, you have been established. That means, you know, all those three elements, the work of faith, the labor of love, and steadfastness of the Lord is actually exciting to Paul. That's why he's rejoicing and praying, isn't it? That is indicating the idea that he was focused on, he was thrilled at the idea that the Thessalonican church was slowly getting established. What is the next next verse? Second Thessalonians two seventeen. Uh, now may our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and the God of our Father, who loved us um, and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts. And establish them in every good work and word. So again, the concept of establish is coming there. So uh, all of these verses we should use to develop our biblical theology as we write our competency. Titus 1.5. Titus 1.5. I'll read those. This is why I left you in Crete, that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. So that concept of putting into order is also part of the establishing process. Putting into order. So he planted the church. He has also developed the church to a significant extent that there could be developed some potential leaders. And he's telling uh, Titus that, hey, hey, I want you to go to every city where we have uh, communities and see that you appoint elders. And for him, why? Because it was about putting it in order. And the whole idea of uh, establishing has the, has the connotation of putting things into order. Okay, So when you initially plant a church, you, it, is, uh, it has to be come to a place where it will fall into order. That means in the teachings, in the maturity of the people growing up, in the, uh, the, uh, the development of leaders, Putting the leaders in place, wrong doctrines are easily 
uh, chucked out. All of those things are important in, in the establishing process. And then we can read 1 Timothy 3, 14 to 16. 1 Timothy 3, 14 to 16. 1 Timothy 3, 14 to 16. I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of truth. Uh, great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the spirit, seen by the angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed upon the world, taken up in glory. So how do we see the concept of uh, establishing here? He's writing to Timothy to put into order the church, like how they should be uh, behaving with each other. Exactly, exactly. So the establishing process has to do with uh, putting everybody in a place that they are being discipled. Uh, they have, uh, they know how to behave. Um, and that they are able to be a pillar and buttress of truth. That means the church is able to hold the truth very, very clearly uh, without. So again, that's another dimension of, uh, and they knew, the, they knew the gospel very well. That's why the, he was manifested in flesh, vindicated by the spirit. This is kind of a, like a creedal statement uh, that was uh, Paul used, probably that he was using everywhere when he went to teach and he would teach them and make them, uh, you know, by heart, you will study that in essentials of sound doctrine. But the idea was that, uh, you know, can you see, I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things so that if I delay, so can you see the urgency for Paul to see that the church remains the buttress of truth, church remains the custodian of the truth, and that the church would uh, not only hold the truth, but behave in a way that they would present the gospel. So the concept of establishing comes like that. The urgency that Paul has. Uh, even if I delay, I want you to do this. I want you to see that everybody behaves in the household correctly. So that the church will be the holder of truth, will be the custodian of truth, will be the displayer of the truth. Okay, I think that's pretty good biblical theology. Enough for us to write easily two pages, three pages. Also to note, like, uh, maybe just a point that Paul is teaching Timothy to do it. Like, uh, he's not doing it himself. He's, he's building a leader who will do it so that the cycle is continuing. Yes, yes. Interesting faithful men in one sense. Yes. So, um, I'm going to read Unit 1, uh, Paul's Church, Churches. Issue 1, if you are all able to get there, we will read. Uh, first one is the... We have already done the, uh, the progressive role of each unit, but I'm going to read it again so that we all know that when we read the articles, when we listen to the articles, we know. Now, if you are if you are smart, you would have taken down all that we were discussing right now. You would have taken down points. So that, what would be the, it is so easy for you to write the competency. What is the first competency question? Develop. Uh, Develop please. It. Hmm. Yes, yes, please go ahead. Develop the basic biblical understanding of Paul's concept of establishing local churches while discerning the difference between what Paul understood to be normative for all churches in every culture and generation and what he intended to be merely cultural mm -hmm. for his time and situation. So you have unit one, issue one, issue two, issue three. And from these three issues, you're going to write that competency. And we are very early in the competency, okay? Very early in the uh, unit, but what we from that the passages that we just now read, you can clearly pull out the idea, the Paul's concept of establishing a church. So that biblical theology is critical for us. From Titus, Thessalonians, from Timothy, from all of those things, you can clearly uh, draw out Paul's strategy, Paul's strategy, how he went about. Those things. I think that should be a. Easily one and a half, two pages of fantastic biblical theology you can write. Okay. Then uh, we're going to go to the project question. Write a one to two page annotated summary of Paul's concept of establishing churches. Include a study of Paul's concept of establishing built around the Greek word 
sterizo and its cognates, which is found in several passages relevant to issue one, also include a summary of Paul's establishing process. Can you, you know, why, why are we reading this question? Now, when we read this question, you know what to look for. What to look for? We have to look for the word establishing and strengthening. And we have to focus on uh, the way Paul used it, the word sterizo, as part of uh, when we are going to uh, present the competency that, uh, of how Paul uh, established the local churches. Let's read uh, also the uh, Socratic questions so that we can discuss it later. At first glance, Paul's missionary activity could appear haphazard and variable to the circumstances he was encountering. However, when closely observed, some patterns seem to appear. To what degree did Paul have a clear strategy as he pursued his missionary activity? Describe core elements of that strategy. Okay, this simple question is simple. As we read the book of Acts, it looks half as that. He seems to be going here. He seems to be doing that. He seems to be going in a particular direction. Okay, he has, it looks half as that. But as we go more and more into it, we see that it is not half as that. He's going through, a, going with a clear strategy. And we need to discover that strategy and present that strategy uh, in our, uh, uh, as after we do the, I mean, now that we've done the biblical theology and when we look at the, um, two articles which will be presented now. According to Paul, what qualities would a church possess if it were established? Can you give me one answer from the biblical theology we did now? Leaders, natural leaders. Good, yeah, leaders. Okay. They know how, and they know how to interact with each other, conduct each other in the house. Behave, house. behave. They know how to behave. Transformation. What about if church becomes a pillar and buttress of truth? It's an establishing, uh, it's, a, it's a picture of an established church. So, uh, or, yeah, please. Yeah, order person, like to have everything in order. Yes. order. And then if you take it from Thessalonians, uh, the, the church is involved in the labor of love. They are steadfast in their faith. They are, one more was there, no? Love, uh, hope, and... Uh, huh? Love. Abound in love, love to one another. No, there are three. Labor of love. Work of faith. Ah, work of faith. All of those indications are something that Paul is uh, looking at a church that is established. Are you able to get the question that he is trying to say? What qualities would a church possess if it were established? So that can go into the competency question, right? So when you read the uh, Socratic questions and when we try to answer it, those are all good points, please. If you're all, I'd ask you as we're writing, as we're talking, write down the points so that tomorrow, you know, when you finish issue three, you should have had half, you know, when you finish issue one, you would have finished off some part of the competency. I should do issue three and issue three just to have to add and polish it, okay? What was the nature of the qualities Paul used? What was the nature of the qualities Paul used to evaluate the maturity and strength of a church? What was the nature of the qualities Paul used to evaluate the maturity and the strength of a church? What does today's evangelical culture consider a strong church? How does Paul's understanding of a mature church differ from what people today consider a solid mature church? It's a good question. We will not answer that because I know that's a deeply engaging question and we will all have good opinions to do. But we'll come back after we finish the articles. Or, or what degree and what sense are Paul's letters to the churches normative? Describe how Paul considered his own letters and the extent he believed they would serve as normative instructions to all churches. Consider specifically its instructions concerning the establishing process and the directives that accompanied them. By the way, this whole co establishing concept is repeated and repeated by Paul in all of his letters. Okay, So apart from what they've given, there's plenty of other material that you can draw from the letters of how Paul's uh, whole idea of establishing a church is considered. All right. I think uh, with that, we should go to the presentations. 
and we should have uh, first article is presented by Rob. Where is Rob? I'm here. Yeah, Rob, Rob. Okay. One second, let me just give you the. I hope you all have read the article. Assistant Japan, you, you read it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, super. Both the articles, huh? Yeah, I read both the articles. Underlined. Super, super articles, Nava, sir. I took four hours just today to do that. I said your sheep is calling. I'm just uh, one second. Just one second. Uh, is the screen visible? Yes, yes, sir. That's good. Okay. Okay, we'll start first. So, uh, this is the first first article A, uh, that is Paul, Paul's concept of establishing, written by Jeff Fried. Rob, and... one minute, huh? Rob, one minute. Yeah. Pastor Cynthia Pin? Pastor? Yeah. Pastor, would you just pray for all of us that as we, you know, this session would be a really... Yeah. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all this... Uh, wonderful teachings that we are receiving. Thank you for Bill and thank you for Dr. George and Lord facilitating these things. God, we pray in this day that you would speak to us, minister to us, give us insight, wisdom, Lord, which we can apply. Lord, as we are all in the ministry, we pray, dear God, when as uh, our brother share the presentations that we'll be able to Gain insight of God. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so uh, this is the Pauline uh, uh, Unit 1 and uh, the Article A, it, <clears throat> it is covered, I think, for all the three issues, this is one of the key articles and uh, it is by the author uh, it's it's by written by Jeff Fried, uh, Paul's concept of establishing. So uh, before the article moves, uh, I think uh, this is this article was given by Jeff Fried in the con context of one conference, where uh, Jeff is taking this as a part of his second session in the conference. So he's just giving some introduction to the previous session which he has taken in the conference. And he is clearing some misconceptions there. And it appears that in the first session, first session of this conference, he was uh, talking about radical restructuring of missionary activity, like uh, pulling all the missionaries home and uh, people taking as if that Jeff is not for missions. And uh, here he is clearing that doubt that uh, 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 Jeff is clearly telling that he is commit. He has a commitment and passion for missions, and that is a qualifier he, where he is building the further article ahead. And uh, here he is. Uh, uh, so he is clearing the misconception conception by telling that he proposed for the radical restructuring of the missionary activity to avoid any dysfunctional or unbiblical uh, way of sending missionaries. 
and local and to make local churches to be more effective and more biblical and one minded so he is also stating it with examples telling uh, he has passion for missions in different parts of the world committed to missions and church cannot relegate central responsibility of mission activity to any para church organizations so he is making this as a uh, uh, a clear statement before he proceed further and for a vital and alive local church missionary activity in evangelism uh, has to be there in its local and surrounding communities and of course establishing churches involves mission and evangelism and also he mentions about uh, acts 28 the last chapter where it is if you read the uh, <clears throat> acts 28 it appears that luke kept it open ended and it was up to us that uh, acts gives us principles for our missionary strategies from generation to generation which allows flexibility to adapt uh, to different cultures and he, he wanted to explain what is the paul's agenda for the missionary enterprise his role and core strategies and principles and uh, that 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 is just the introductory part he was mentioning and uh, uh, also he gave he is giving two fundamental statements which is further explaining in the coming sessions uh, he is talking about leadership training is all about establishing churches and also missionary activity is all about establishing churches so this fundamental two statements he is upfront stating so that uh, while we do the uh, uh, while we do the Uh, the paul's involvement in all this we will it will he will make it more clear and so that is the introductory part now uh, the main uh, agenda is to uh, explain what is paul's role in establishing uh, the churches so when we go to the uh, it is in the reader 9 so it starts there so it, the the key words here is ephesians chapter 3 8 to 10 uh can someone read that uh, it's a small portion i think i think i can read from here yeah, it's there so it's it talks about yeah someone can read to me though i am the very least of all the saints this grace was given to uh, this grace was given to preach to the gentiles the unsearchable riches of christ and to bring to the light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in god who created all things so that the church so that through the church the manifold wisdom of god might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places okay yeah thanks pastor so it uh, so basically paul describes the bigger picture of church and how the church fits into the unfolding plan of god and uh, here also it mentions about paul's twofold job description what are those twofold job description one is to preach the gospel to the gentiles and uh, plan churches establish it and use churches as a base to further the gospel so if you see the paul's early letters he is more focused on this as Uh, uh of establishing the church and uh, if and and again what the second uh, job description the second part of the job description would be like light the administration of the mystery that means the plan the house order or the management of the church and being a long term witness within their own communities which he focused more towards the latter letters uh, which we will uh, discuss in the coming session so the based on this key verses key verses these are the two fold dis, uh, job description for paul and uh, so also uh, as i mentioned before paul dis- describes the bigger picture of church and how church fits in the unfolding plan of god and christ becomes the cornerstone and foundation is laid by the apostles and the prophets and Uh, so what is the mystery of the church jews and gentiles becoming one and the church becoming center of god's plan and so as i mentioned uh, just to summarize what i am just uh, told the early letter majored on on the gospel and initially establishing the churches in gospel that is the first description part and the latter letters 
brought to light how the church should function harmoniously so that uh, they would be long term witnesses within their own com uh, communities and the community needed to function in relation to one another as a household within certain kinds of call it's like uh, it, the community is literally has to be a family of families and uh, it has to be set in order so all these things is uh, systematically addressed in uh, early and later letters uh, if you see ex especially in titus 1:5 uh, towards the, this has one of the later letters which we need to consider and he is talking about upon letters with certain kinds of qualities uh, lights within their own communities and would adorn the gospel of god so it's like a long term engagement of the church within the communities he wants to establish and one another letter is first timothy 3:15 he says he talks about leadership elders and deacons uh, who are godly leaders who can take up the mantle and go forward so All, the main aspect is how the household should relate as a community of faith in order to be fully established so that is that is paul's uh, uh, role in the entire thing of establishing this church and uh, so what is really this paul's concept of establishing we have heard this name uh, this term establishing uh, in many scriptural verses we read before so what is paul's concept of establishing uh so if you see one of the concepts that helps us understand paul's ministry is the idea of establishing uh if you see his ministry it's all about idea of establishing and nasb uh introduces this uh, consistently uses this word establishing in number of passages in relation to paul and uh, so what is paul's uh, modus operandi what he usually do uh, paul went into an area and he connected with people he led people to christ he gathered that cluster of believers together instructed them and organized to a local church including appointing leaders he again went back through different tools for strengthening the churches so that is another term we can use for establishing that is strengthening the churches or one more term is confirming uh, what we Uh, what is seen in the uh, scriptures so these are some of the terms used in relation to paul uh, uh, with respect to establishing the churches so what was what was really paul's uh, we have seen paul's uh, twofold job description before uh, one is to preach the gospel and uh, uh, to establish the house order so how what is the paul strategy to fulfill his job description so what are those preach gospel and take gospel further and further and to bring light the administration how things would be done and more than this how he aggressively in a shorter period of time he fulfilled his uh, job so that is what we are uh, learning we are getting into that in the coming sessions so uh, so now we will get into the into paul strategy and what is what are the paul strategy to establish the church so as i mentioned before uh, paul went into an area he shared the gospel and he led people to christ gathered believers instructed them planned a church and appointed matured godly leaders and also there is some aspect which uh, jeff is mentioning about the leaders the leader leaders might not be theologically very well educated but uh, paul was literally looking for some of the character qualities to lead and oversee each community and through his church through his letters he has been instructing them how to uh, how to establish the churches and the next part is yeah so so what what paul what what are the tools which paul used to, to establish the churches so he continued establishing by letters visits by prayer by training key men so these are some of the tools which paul used to establish the churches and uh so in that establishing in that letters what paul did he encouraged churches uh, uh to uh, to uh, to be one minded in the progress of gospel be matured communities of faith adorn the gospel within communities by their maturity 
relationships, lives, quality of church community, lives and impact in the community. So basically he is talking about being matured in their relationship with each other and being an impact to the communities wherever the church is planted. So he is talking in that terms, the establishment. So, uh, and, and most of the Paul's letters, they are not giving any systematic theology to the churches as the author himself is mentioning. It's more of functional in nature. So he is addressing some specific issues uh, and some of the problems the churches are facing and uh, to establish them in the gospel and to set the house order. And also uh, he has his men on his team like Timothy and Titus and his visits. These are some of the tools uh, he used for establishing the churches. And so the main purpose of establishing, one of the main purposes of establishing the church is Paul wanted to make that church as a base for taking the gospel to new frontiers. So that is the purpose of establishing the church. Uh, so that's why the importance of, uh, I will explain uh, the importance of establishing the churches. So why, well, so let us get into the significance of an established church. So as uh, so, what Jeffrey is let's let's read what Jeffrey is telling about the importance of churches to be established. So let us read this: the gospel of God would not be adorned within a particular community unless these communities were thriving and growing as pictures of Christ to that community, a collective picture of Christ to that community. So unless the churches are. Uh, uh, the, the the gospel doesn't transform their lives and their lives as a community doesn't adorn the gospel uh, within a particular community. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. So it, so the importance of churches to be established, he's making it clear. Uh, for example, he's giving two examples. One is uh, the Philippians church. So Paul considered Philippians church uh, churches as a base for taking the gospel to new frontiers. Uh, so he, in his letter to the Philippians, he also addressed few of the issues there. What are those issues? The letter addressed to deal the disunity within the church. Why? Why? Why is very much talking about disunity within the church? Because that subtle disunity within the church can means that to the outside community. Uh, it shows that the church is not living humbly in relationships and couldn't be one-minded for the progress of the gospel. So Paul is specifically addressing that issue so that the church will be more matured. So once you deal with this disunity issue, they can be used as base for effective base for furthering the gospel. And also it doesn't, so he is addressing few issues at the same time, he's praising uh, many of the other aspects in the Philippians church uh, for uh, praise for being fellow participants in the progress of the gospel, uh, for sending Epaphroditus, their me messenger, and supporting and funding in the gospel uh, initiative by Paul. So, uh, he's, so this Philippian church is one of the churches where he used as a base for progressing the gospel. Now, let us look into another church where he... Uh, he left the door open for the gospel, but he literally walked away fr from it because the, the Corinthian church needed more work to do. So that is what here he is talking about. The Corinthian church is one such church where it's not, the Paul didn't feel like it's matured enough to, uh, or act as a base for furthering the gospel. So what he did, uh, so what Paul, according to Paul, the, uh, the, the churches needs to be strong established churches uh, and churches need to be the central which central uh, uh, entity which impacts community and acts as a base for furthering the gospel and uh, paul also knew that uh, if he kept going further and further out with the, with the gospel and not having strong established churches his whole base would be eroded uh, means uh, he wouldn't get the additional help and reinforcement required for advancing the gospel if the churches are not established well. So Corinthian church is one such church where uh, he, let, he left the door open. At the same time, he worked on the church to make it more established. So uh, that is the importance of the establishing church part uh, he's covering. Now let us get into the 
Uh, what are these letters we are talking about? Robin, uh, Robin, one question. Yeah. Um, what do you mean by Paul leaving the door open uh, for the Corinthian church? Yeah, I, I'll handle that, uh, Rob. Yeah. yeah. Rob, can you just uh, close the presentation one minute? Uh, who, who asked the question? Sorry. Chai, Chai. Chai. Chai, what happened is, um, um, if you predict that particular passage, if you go there, uh, uh, what is that? Second Corinthians 2. 12 to 14. Yeah. Second Corinthians. Uh, Second Corinthians 2, 12 to 14. When I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, even though a door was opened for me in the Lord, my spirit was not rest because I did not find my brother Titus there. Uh, so I took leave of them and went to Macedonia. Okay, the idea there is he, though he got an open door for ministry there in Troas, he felt that he should go and deal with the Corinthian church. Okay, I need to go to the Corinthian church because there are problems in the Corinthian church. The church is not thoroughly established. So when Paul, Paul is having an opportunity to plant a church versus establishing a church, for Paul, the establishing was more key that he would forsake an open door of ministry and go after the establishing. It's like weighing. He's weighing and showing that Paul chose establishing over planting. Does that make sense, Chai? Okay. Rob, continue. Anybody else? Any queries? First to page 11, uh, Chai, you can read page 11, you know, of the article. It's explained in that last few paragraphs, what passage well, is. Let, 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 let's just read it, okay? We'll read it, sister. Thank you. He came Hello. to Troas. He came into Troas and there was a wide open door for the gospel. Sometimes you get the sense that Paul would go into an area and he would say, boy, here's an open door of the gospel. Actually, it's a wall, but I'm sure there's a hole or a door here somewhere. So he kicks it open, moves through it, and it's a wide open door for the gospel. But... In this particular text, 2 Corinthians 2.14, he says that the door was flung wide open to the gospel. I mean, it wasn't a matter of trying to find out a way to get the gospel. Evidently, he had some uh, very significant presenting opportunities, but he was very troubled in his spirit. It says uh, in the text, he had no rest because he hadn't heard from Titus, his brother, who was bringing news of how the Corinthian church was doing. So he left the wide open door for the gospel, went to deal with the church. Why? Not because he was more concerned about the churches than the gospel or about the health of a church and missions, nothing like that. But he had a whole plan. He was one-minded about the plan. He knew that he had established a beachhead of Christians and that God, beachhead means a stronghold. He had a stronghold of a community in that com, uh, Corinthian community that would, that would pull, push the gospel through. They established a beachhead of Christians and that God had a plan for them to go into their own community and have an impact on their own community. He knew that he had to stick with that plan, that the churches needed to be uh, the, be central. He also knew that if he kept going further and further out with the gospel and he did not have strong established churches, his whole base would be eroded. That's what the Rob had told. Are, are you, are, is everybody able to get this concept? Because these are very key concepts which will go into the uh, competency writing. In, in also in our understanding of uh, Paul and the way he did ministry. Also, Joseph, you want to say something? No, we are correct. I got it. Okay. Chai, are we good to go? Rob, let's take it on. I think I think I'll read that further two sentence also. Okay. So if his base was eroded, the gospel would not progress, and ultimately he would have to take the gospel to them again. And he would not have the additional help and reinforcement or the models that were needed. So the, the consequence of not establishing the church. That mean, in other words, what he was saying is he was an excellent planter and he had open door opportunities, but he did not look at going further and further, but he decided that what he had, he would establish thoroughly. Rob? Yeah, we'll go. So we'll get into the Pauline letters. 
so the the basic idea of Paul writing these letters, according to Paul, missions is a matter of establishing churches, and uh, yeah, and uh, in, through these letters, the Spirit of God worked in Paul to produce a whole set of letters for us for establishing churches. So we don't have Paul personally with us. We don't have the apostles whom Paul sent. We have only his letters, and uh, so the letters are actually our tools uh, for us to establish churches. And uh, so if you see uh, in the present time, uh, it's more of the Bible we read mainly from an individualistic perspective. And we always concerned about multiplication of individuals. Whereas in Acts, it's more of multiplication of believing communities or the churches and it's more of a community-based relationship rather than individualistic. So the letters were addressed not to individuals. The letters were addressed to churches or to men, how to establish churches and how to set them in order. And uh, uh, for example, some of the uh, uh, letters, Galatians, Thessalonians, Corinthians, Romans are mainly focused on establish the churches in the gospel. So, so the main logic here is uh, uh, if somebody has received the gospel and uh, are, we a, are we still can, after a few, few uh, some time leaving that person alone, are we, still a, are we still able to tell that that, that fruit is preserved or this, uh, is that person established in the gospel and is that person is understanding the gospel and its implications? So uh, it's not from an individualistic perspective, but even if a church is planted, uh, can we tell at a later point of time uh, the church is still established in the faith? And uh, are they, are they <clears throat> fulfilling the gospel in its real meaning? And so that's, that comes to the Paul's early letters. Uh, so he, we, we can see a couple of examples. So in the book of in the Galatians, uh, Paul is telling who bewitched you that you have so quickly departed from the gospel itself. So he is talking about addressing the main issue. Uh, so they have, it seems the Galatian church, Galatian church have moved away from the gospel. So he's addressing that. So it, basically there, Paul is establishing them the gospel in this letter. And to the letter to the Corinthians, uh, so addressing a church with all possible problems and implications of not understanding the gospel correctly. So again, Paul is uh, establishing the church in the gospel. And in Thessalonians, he's uh, encouraging them to stand in the gospel. Romans, he is giving the entire treatise of the gospel. So basically, the early letters of Paul is mainly focused on establish to establish the churches in the gospel. So here two things we need to uh, keep in mind. One is the narrow understanding of gospel. Like uh, we usually tell, we share the gospel, the content, and uh, we consider the sharing the gospel and the person receiving the gospel is as an end to itself. Uh, but according to Paul, that is an initial foot in the door. And uh, from where we need to work on further maturing the individual and the community. And there is also one more issue don't don't understand don't understand the gospel fully so uh, that will literally change our ministries or narrow our ministries or we will be more focused on just uh, converting people by just sharing the gospel rather than planting the church so uh, for addressing these issues paul paul's early letters were focusing on mainly to establish the churches in gospel so uh, so we need to have gospel so according to author, the gospel is far more holistic. So it's not just the content we share, but the gospel transforms our lives and beings, causes us to relate holistically with another person in the community, enables the person to hear the gospel, encounter the person of Christ within the community and see Christ in our lives. So we need to have a holistic picture of gospel in our lives as well as when we share the gospel with others. So, uh, so from this uh, viewpoint, Paul is writing these early letters to the churches. 
and uh, yeah that comes that these are the paul's early letters and coming to the paul's middle and final letters paul has a desire uh, paul had a desire to further establish the churches he founded so let us read from jeff what jeff fried wants to tell paul wanted them to understand their place in the magnificent unfolding plan of god so that as churches they might grasp the significance of their calling and experience an unleashing of christ's power within their midst with one mind participating in the progress of gospel with paul so that is the intention of the paul's middle letters and uh, so so the 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 logical flow is like that he established a community planted a church and uh, as as paul is uh, trying to implement the sorry establish the gospel and uh, uh, because of their sinful issues a lot of problems arise and during that time he want to establish them the gospel and to take further paul gave, paul is giving them a vision where they are going uh, to make them understand the church as the center of god's salvation uh, in history plan so uh, so it's a uh, it's it's literally paul is giving them a, a bigger vision so that they will have a clear direction where they need to go and uh, to establish them as a community based uh, and holistic gospel propagation for literally for holistic gospel propagation and uh, uh, also he wanted the church to know how the church can participate in his great plan and by by doing missions next door and overseas as a community so mainly the participating in the mission and uh, to understand their uh, place in the god's overall plan so coming this is a paul this is a, this is from the paul's middle letter coming to the false final final letter so when your paul is about to finish the course and uh, especially first and second timothy uh, talks about way to order their communities so why uh, paul always relate these churches to households because uh, any in any generation in any any time anyone can relate to the families so definitely paul is relating uh, the church as a household individual household so he is also explaining significance of well trained faithful leaders uh, so timothy to pass on the deposit to avoid getting eroded so it's a passing of deposit he is stressing more on uh, passing on the deposit or the knowledge or the faith which is which they have gained to a new set of well trained faithful leaders yeah as mentioned paul worked with a household concept uh, church as a family of families it's they are not organizations but uh, uh, a consideration of uh, it's mainly mainly focus of focused on christ centered relationship within a household and uh, because people are going to understand because this can be a normative principle where people can understand in any generation or any time or in any culture where churches are connected to when churches are connected to household so in short the beauty of the simplicity of the multiplication of churches plan the multiplication of communities will work any time any place and in any culture so that is what uh, the intention of all these letters uh, to establish uh, the churches so uh, i think this uh, summary slide which i took pastor shared before so the tools to establish where he is considering paul's early letters middle letters and the latter letters so he is going uh, step by step to make it more matured so that it can act as a base for advancing gospel and being a light within their own communities and to uh, be a, and to sustain long term within their communities so so that comes to the conclusion uh so there's he, jeff is challenging us to ask few questions with regard to our own churches and uh, one of some of the questions are uh, is the fruit being preserved uh, are the, can we tell the believers are established are the churches being established and multiplying are adequate number of leaders being raised up to nurture the churches as well as being sent from the churches uh so basically uh, the the author is telling we need to align with the kind of philosophy and the strategy that paul gave to us 
he is giving two examples. One is uh, an example of evangelism in Africa, where he's talking many people are converted due, uh, uh, through many uh, conventions and all, but uh, ultimately the question arises, how many converts are really established in their faith? When we look at the numbers, the real numbers, it's very few. And uh, so uh, he's talking about the shallow understanding of evangelism. And also, how about leadership training in Bang uh, Brazil? When there is an explosion of new converts started coming up, there is a need for a lot of leaders in Brazil. And what happened is the seminaries couldn't produce that kind of uh, uh, leaders. It means that many number of leaders to take care of the uh, new convert. So what author is telling, uh, I think, community-based leadership and le established uh, leaders, mature leaders from established churches are needed for taking up this role. So in short, simply going back to the pattern, help people stand on their feet, unleash the church. That's what uh, the author is uh, telling here. And the, the last sentence I would say would be the leadership training and mission uh, is always uh, a matter of establishing churches. And uh, yeah, I think, so uh, in the last sentence, author is telling, once we have the con the, that concept down, we will be much more effective over the long haul in carrying out the task that God has given us to do of assisting Christ in building his church in our generation. So I think that's the end of the, Article. I'll bring it down. Thank you. Can you now only share it on the chats? Oh, can you share it on the chat also, that uh, PPT? Yeah. For me, when I first read this article and started doing the Pauline course uh, about four or five years back, I went through a paradigm shift. A complete paradigm shift. This whole idea of establishing was was so powerful. Uh, so for me, this whole this course is very exciting in terms of because it's still area still I'm learning. Preaching the gospel, planting churches is easy. I mean, right now we are getting the hang of it. We got an idea. Uh, we can do acts very well, but Pauline is a very very difficult hand in the mud, in the dirt kind of a job and. Uh, uh, he's given a fantastic, uh, Rob, fantastic presentation. I think uh, Jeff also would have not had this clarity the way you presented it. Thank you, Pastor. Okay, let's have some discussion. What What do people say about what we just heard? Uh, Pastor, I have one question. Um, when can one say that a church is fully established? Uh, when you have a good set of leaders coming up and that your church is already sending out leaders, the church is sending out leaders, you have fantastic leadership that is uh, and the, uh, rearing up new leaders in your church. Uh, the church is, That means it is involved in local missions and it is also involved in uh, distant missions. And the life, the, their life, their behavior is presenting the gospel into the local community. That's a mature church. I mean, that's the way I look at it. Because that's one of the questions you have in your uh, competency questions. How do you know a church is established? What are the signs of that? So some of those signs are there in the biblical theology that we did, in the in the scriptures that we read, those ideas are there. The church is involved in the labor of love. Uh, they are in, uh, you know, uh, the work of faith and in the uh, steadfastness of hope. The church is able to manifest all these. It's a good sign of a very mature, established church. Okay, okay, Pastor. Senior Pastors, please. This is not my question. According to the context and the cultural context where I am in, uh, question, why do we need a church? Why can't we eat individual? Okay. This is going back to our uh, previous course. <laughs> I 
I think we have already settled it, that it is uh, in acts. We already went through the paradigm shift. We have realized it's not individuals. We are not multiplying in disciples, but we are multiplying churches. The whole idea that church is the eternal purpose of God, the central uh, central uh, figure in the grand plan of uh, Jesus Christ for for Earth, is very clear from the Book of Acts. But the today, the, the, what we are the, what we are here now focusing is on the idea of establishing. That means you have planted a church. How important do you consider it to work on that church to establish it? And then, how do we establish it? What are we going to uh, put into the church to establish it? Thank you. The problem we have is mainly uh, because of the culture here. People are not willing to go outside so especially after pandemic it's very difficult and even visiting people are also not easy so um, and even the culture here is everybody is okay to go to a building and you know participate especially our things are a house church so uh, opening the house even People think, hey, how can I go to another house? You know, but many people are okay to building and, uh, you know, they are okay in that context. So that community is still, the what we describe here is not experiencing in the regular people's life, even though the church going people, you know, I'm talking about. It's a, like a Sunday thing and some Bible study, that's it. Don't cross the border, that's it. You cross, you can it can get a negative impact, you know. So that's a tough part here. I think um, which we need to deal with, and I don't know how to deal that, break that barrier. Of course, through the word of God and teaching, but uh, you know, it's not easy. So take it with you. Yes. Where is Pastor Sindhip and Pastor Sindhip, please, you should have something definitely to say. Yeah, about the community, that's, uh, that's in the book of Acts, you know, that is very essential for us to uh, come together as a community of God's people. That's, that's where nurturing can be done. Nurturing and disciple can be done. Does uh, Jeff's article have uh, some kind of a paradigmatic effect on you? on your thinking about ministry or what you were doing till now uh, do you feel that you got a better clarity on okay this is how i need to do it this is how i need to establish the church uh, was there anything paradigmatic that uh, caught you off guard as it's a wow this is something that i never thought about before rob you can also speak uh, because i think you have are you there, Rob? Yeah. You're also involved in four church planting, so you can also speak. Everybody can speak. Anybody can speak. I'm just encouraging more and more. So, my sister, you should also speak to the uh, Daisy. I have one question. I know Jeff is of this, of course, we, we know the truth, but at just a critical uh, point of view, saying that, uh, you know, um, missionary activity is nothing but establishing the churches. Also, another place it says, where evangelization is always a matter of establishing churches. If that's the case, why Jesus never mentioned about that much importance? Uh, you know, during his ministry. 
mentioned what that uh, focusing on establishing the as a community brother it is so clear so evident it is all over the gospel he took 12 people and invested his entire life into them he so much established them isn't it yeah, if i was i mean if i was uh, looking at it in a different way jesus should have just gone around everywhere have half of uh, uh, israel converted in no time because he had the power right but what did he do he invested all he had into 12 plus we don't know maybe 70 was there 120 was there we don't know but he invested isn't it he invested that full time as far as the gospels from what we see he invested his time in developing those few people i think the concept is the and same he, it's yeah but again that's again an individual call for those people right no it's a community again no they are having a community there right yeah i know but they are called individually and placed as a together right into a community yes so, so you yes. are shared the gospel as an individual right somebody shared the gospel individually to you correct but that person coming to you with the gospel is part of a church right i feel that what pastor subhash says is, is also correct the only thing is it, it as uh, pastor george said this is the context of the church context of the community you cannot do it individually you can you can you know be a believer separately apart from the church and do something you have to be yeah, yeah. in the context yeah, within the context of the church so the whole thing the call also works only in within the context of the church you can you know many of uh, i've i've seen people going from pillar to post and you know clueless about what the church planting is because they have said that i've been called but not within the community context they said that we have been called separately and they are literally starving literally you know doing they do not know what to do because they not uh, what do you say trained within the uh, within the community and then when that uh, is not happening when the training within the community is not happening people will become clueless and they get fed up they have seen people leave the ministry and go also yeah that, that, that's true that's so uh, you know that so be as you said important. individual call is there individual call is there but everything happens and you know it gets consolidated and reinforced within the context of the community without which you cannot work without community you cannot work you cannot go you cannot do anything that's why you know why, why yeah. a person called me uh, the other day one person called me and said uh, i am you know literally frustrated with the whole thing because i have i went as a missionary to a strange place you know doing things alone nobody is praying for him nobody is supporting him uh, he thought that you know somebody would support him nobody is supporting him because he is 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 not gone from the gone from a church not at a church sent him so literally he is starving nothing you know he ultimately came back frustrated family in different ways you know it's not in the within the context of the community that's what uh, pass george was trying to say so your individual call is there but that is materializing in the, within the context of the church and the idea that jesus invested into people into a limited number of people because he was interested to set a nice strong community that would do the job and that same pattern is what the uh, paul is following and i think uh, when um, your jeffrey says the church is a larger household made up of a number of households we can take example of our families extended families you know when we cut off from families and people and try to live our life on our own support whether it is emotional or anything is lacking then we just uh, you know we just uh, exist without being able to share care spur one another so i think within a church community that's what happens and only from there we can maybe extend or move forward so can i no. yeah, please yeah can i ask one question to uh, subhash brother uh, pastor i just want one question uh, see when you are supported from an outside agency okay what you do is actually you can do you can do individual ministry if you are not supported 
by an indo i mean outside ministry you are trying to establish a community and the community is trying to support you how can you uh, move forward without the community helping you and taking you forward it is it is very very difficult see uh, i am no, telling no, you no, i am no, 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 <laughs> yeah i'm just uh, telling you my my own experience actually starting a church in chennai now without the community and the whole people supporting me i cannot move as a, a church planter and actually establish a church here the community who is actually in fact who is st standing with me maybe a few people only but they are standing with me and they are actually in fact the ones who is actually in fact helping the people also who is coming to the church newly uh, helping them grow as a, a team uh, i cannot do it myself how can i do it it will be a total flop for me if i try to do it individually without he uh, taking the help of the church yeah i totally understand that there is no question about that but uh, i'm just uh, um, you know thinking about the way things are working here ah. and i see for example uh probably you know um, hudson taylor william carey i mean they all came and we see the fruits we are we are also experiencing the impact and many of them um they are not literally you know fully supported by you know i know we had a, a article regarding that earlier too but uh this is a i mean individual you know conflict or the whatever you know uh the there is me, no you know uh, yeah you know brother so that's what i'm saying yeah, we are all products of uh the paradigms that are currently existing yeah for example from luther to carey we read that the piet pietism in the early church so in that we uh, talked about how individual mission agency started carey actually went back to the church but the church couldn't see at that time because the churches were all in a mess because of the theology that were came with the predestination and all that stuff and they were so focused on trying to beat the catholic church that they couldn't think about missions so carry went ahead and started his own thing and after that the mission agencies all started into this thing then everybody every individual started doing a mission agencies that means collect money from the churches where do the mission agencies get money from from the individuals big donors and from churches so then the paradigm the paradigm got corrupted that is now what the spirit of god is doing is taking us back to the original apostolic paradigm that we may recapture it that doesn't mean we throw away the mission agencies also we learn to handle the mission agencies and para church organizations understanding the original paradigm and keeping the original paradigm in perspective that's what we're trying to do i i i'm i'm, I'm for para churches i'm not against para church but i know what the church is supposed to do and the para church comes below that and is a slave to the church in in one, in in the way of function okay one of the things that i want to i mean i i was hoping that people would say but i'm just going to share with you i think what is the most important thing that um uh, rob actually shared from jeffrey's issue here was and i'll give you a verse also a very interesting verse for you to write in your competency so an apostolic team comes to a let's say a, a town a city let's call it corinth the team comes and they first plant a church okay there are people there the apostolic team functions and the next city is let's say ephesus the team may or may not go and in the other part of the city appoint another church and another church here imagine this has got about uh, uh 20 lakh people this church is about 20 this is about uh, 10 this is about uh, 30 people Paul establishes these churches and then moves out of the city and goes to the next church, uh, city and establishes a church. And then he moves to another part of the city, probably, and establishes a church. And then from there he goes 
to the next city. Let us call it Athens. Okay. He moves from there and he comes. This is the apostolic team. Okay. Apostolic team, apostolic team. This is the itinerant missionary team that is sent from the churches. So this is probably, let's say, sent from the Antioch church. Antioch. And uh, here they establish one church, maybe another one more church. And from there they move on to, let's say, uh, Crete. Crete. Now, uh, what, what, I, what, what we need to see the the need for um, establishing so the apostolic team is staying here let's say this whole episode maybe they spend uh, uh, six months here they spend a year here one year they spend about another six months here <clears throat> so they are looking at around two years of work here and they moved on then they spend another uh, one and a half years here two years here like that they're moving on planting churches but as they move on their responsibility is the apostolic team is sending suppose the apostolic team is on the way here from here the apostolic team is sending uh, emissaries and letters okay to see that they're established why because the function of these three churches which is about 20 plus 30 50 plus 60 people is to reach out to this 20 lakh people. Unless they are established, they cannot reach out to this 20 lakh people. So why did Paul consider this very critical? Because Paul was an apostle. His job was to conquer, uh, set up uh, beachheads in every uh, city possible. And uh, as it, I got a music coming from somewhere, sorry. Okay, so um, can we see this in the book of Acts? Are we all able to see this in the book of Acts? He came here, he established a church. Now let's say for in Crete, when you read that verse in the, uh, Titus, he says, the churches, see that you uh, put the things into order. If you read that, can you just read that? Um, uh, this is why I left you in Crete. Let's say that he left uh, uh, Titus here. Titus is left here by Paul. And Paul, after establishing this church and this church, moved to the next city. Okay. Let's say it is Troas. Okay. But Titus, he left here. What was he supposed to do? He was supposed to, he was supposed to um, put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town that has a directed you. That means in three different towns, he had planted communities and he wanted them to put an elder here, wanted to put an elder here, an elder here. But you know what? The church is only having about 15 people, 30 people, maybe 40 people here. The, the community may be having about uh, 18 lakh people. The responsibility of this community was to reach out to these 18 lakh people. So this was local. This was a local influence that was to grow and influence the community. So for this church, individual local church, working in a small city network, this churches were to encourage each other and to influence that city. That was the idea. So um, the, the preaching of the gospel gathered them into communities, established, uh, instructed them, established them, and leaders developed out of them, commended them, entrusted the ministry to them, and they moved on. But those communities were to continue to remain there, adorning the gospel, salt uh, and light, a city upon a hill, a lamp upon a lampstand, so that this dark world in this city would be able to... Uh, are we able to understand the idea why the establishing was critical for Paul? Paul knew if these churches were not established, he would have come reached till here, but these churches would have died already. And the world would have got into them and finished them off. The, I'm just trying to explain to you the criticality of the establishing part of missions. The criticality. So missions, if we were to say, is equal to planting plus establishing. That's a simple concept I'm giving because, and this we did in Acts, 
and this we are doing in Pauline. The next course after Pauline we are going to do is essential sound doctrines. The, the, what are we, what is that going to do? How did Paul, what did Paul use to establish the church? He used the teachings. That's what we're going to do. What was the product? It was leaders. What was the product of establishing a church thoroughly? You had you developed leaders. That is the how the course will go, and that's how we finish the semen part of it. But uh, the all of these churches, all of these churches for Paul was very important because they were strategic. And when when he had finished all of this, all the way from Jerusalem to Illyricum. Okay, all the way. He said, there is no more place left for me. Okay, now I want you to take that verse and then you will understand the concept more clear, clearly. Uh, can you move with me to Romans? Romans 15, Romans 15. Uh, Romans 15 and verse 18 onwards, I'll read. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. When Paul is saying this, it would have been if he started his work around 35 AD, he is talking this around 55, 56 AD. Okay, uh, possibly, we're not exactly sure. Let's say even 60 AD, if he, if he is writing this. Uh, you are talking about close to 25 years. Okay, and he says, I have finished. I have a, uh, well, he says that. All the way around Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. And thus, I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. Okay. Then you read verse 22. This is the reason why I have so, of, why I have so often been hindered from coming to you. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, which regions? Jerusalem to Illyricum. Okay, Jerusalem to Illyricum. Since I have no uh, this thing um, in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you pass again. So the idea was there's no place left. Okay, now I want you to know, I want you to just see uh, uh, something. Uh, just hold, uh, hold on. So what is Paul telling here? Paul is telling us that, hey, guys, where is Jerusalem? Jerusalem is here. All this way, Illyricum is uh, up here, okay? Somewhere in the up here, it is there. this is uh, Rome. But all the way up to the Aegean Sea nations and upper above this place, one second, hold on. Upper, you see this Macedonia and all. Above that is um, Illyricum. Okay, it's a region. So 
what is he talking about he says all these places all these places and lirkam lirkam is modern yugoslavia okay thank you pastor so all of these places i i have finished now does this mean when paul is saying this in this 25 years everybody in this area was preached the gospel was everybody in this place preached the gospel no no but why 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 does he say this there's no more place left for me because this work is job of establishing churches is complete exactly so his job was to put churches in strategic places and then it was the mission of the local church to reach out to the local areas through the preaching of the gospel and through adorning of the gospel that means their life as a community would be a display of the gospel and how would their lives display the gospel when they had very powerful family life when they had powerful community life when they would be a witness in their workplace when they knew how to submit to their leaders i mean in to their uh, bosses and things like which you will see and it will be the whole study on how are you establishing a church what is household order how do you uh, set uh, an individual house in order how do you set the community of church in order that is be the content of the of the establishing process but the idea that paul is saying that i have finished my work there's no more place left for me he was a apostle who strategically worked to plant churches in strategic locations and then it was their responsibility to go ahead and uh, 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 one second so let me let me talk to you of another uh, interesting thing okay so here we have ephesus okay here Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and one more was there, no? Laodicea. Oh, okay, let's say all of these churches. Paul did not touch any of Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia. Did you see? Did we hear of Paul establishing those churches? No. No. Who established them? Maybe Paul's disciples. The Ephesian church. the efficient church center because they were locally influencing this place are you able to understand how why for paul that criticality of establishing the efficient church was very important because it was then the responsibility of that church to deal with that region with regard to the preaching of the gospel and establishing other communities that was so critical for paul i think that should have that should be able to i mean uh give you a i mean a, some clarity towards how what we are so why we had what uh, jeff is trying to speak to us also uh it's isn't it a fantastic tool now that when i plant a new church i teach them first the early letters it'll be amazing isn't it because we are using the same tools paul used and then once the church is mature and established in the gospel we teach them the middle letters and as we finish the middle letters you are slowly seeing leaders develop so you are teaching uh, the pastorals or what we call as the tertiary wouldn't that be an excellent curriculum for our church i'm just giving an idea in the establishing process but first principles is that to me exactly it's exactly the same okay can we do the next person any questions on this i think uh, uh, this is a fantastic article we all should read it make our own uh, notes and uh, this thing and use jeff read extensively in all of your papers all of your papers use him extensively because that's what it's all about first just one question mm-hmm. can everyone become planters uh you can be part of it mm-hmm. okay okay yes we can for example you uh, as a i mean uh, uh, let's say that in a church you are able to you may grow up to be a leader in that local church which is as critical about uh, lo- reaching out to local or you may be uh, moving into the traveling itinerary 
community that is going around and setting up new churches. But in the church, you may have roles of a deacon, you may have roles of a, a elder or teaching elder, or you may have uh, roles of supporting the people in difficult situations. There are so many areas that which we will learn that within the churches we have roles to do. Without them, the church cannot grow and become a business. Yes. yes. But the but what we are looking at is the broad picture of how God works. Mm. How God worked to take in about 25, 30 years re covering a large region. Can you see that the Illyricum to Jerusalem is how far? Yes. Huge. Yeah. That's the picture that God is giving us from this whole yeah. process. Okay, who is the next one on the line to present? Pastor me. Pastor. Take it on. <laughs> Can I share the screen? Uh, Pastor, yes, please do. You, you, are, you have rights. By the way, this article is also brilliant. FF Bruce. Okay, let's, uh, this is actually from, again, this is article I, that is Paul and his letters. So if you have your books, you don't have to take your books because I've written the, the entire gist on the PowerPoint. So we'll start off the first slide. Here it says, you know, it's a overall uh, overview of what the New Testament is all about. It contains 27 documents or books, 21 of them written primarily to churches, 13 of them written by Paul, and out of that, nine of them to young churches, according to J.B. Phillips, established by Paul himself. And you can see that Paul is addressing the believers like a father, scolding them at times, warning them, and also encouraging them with an intention of seeing them mature. And as Pastor said, as, as uh, Dr. George said, to establish them. So the whole thing, the believers. So that's why he is talking like a father, scolding and warning them at times, but also encouraging them. Next, you know, he talks about Paul's world significance. What does that mean? Now, I want you to imagine a situation if Paul had not been there. How would the scenario be? Just think, think about it. If, if Paul, you know, Paul made, the, he made a whale of a difference in the gospel propagation, and we all know that. So the whole work by Bruce is to emphasize the life and work of Paul as to how it influenced the history and the direction of the gospel after the life of Christ on the earth. So we know that it's a, God, the, the Christianity is actually an Asian religion, but today Christianity is considered as a European religion, a handicap that is trying to overcome even today. You know, anywhere you go, people say it is Cyprus. Even uh, in Kerala, you'll find it is a Saip's religion. Saip in the Madhatileki Poi. You know, they always talk about Saip's religion. It is not Saip's religion. It is actually very much Asian. And Paul, being a Roman citizen, took advantage of the strategic cities and trade centers, communication and logistics of the Roman Empire, as well as the heritage, culture, and wisdom of the Greeks to make it an official region religion of the empire in three decades time. We can see that, you know, Paul did not, you know, make it official or anything, but, you know, as the people received the gospel and because of the changed lives, because of the transformation within the communities, they could influence the, the larger communities and ultimately it became an official religion in a time of, you know, three, three decades or, you know, you, you can see that the whole thing 
you know, reached across to the whole of the, uh, the, the, the Roman Empire. So that is what we see, you know, the situation because of Paul or because, you know, we know that, you know, the, 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 the Jewish believers in, in Jerusalem and its surroundings hardly made any difference in, uh, you can see the propagation of the gospel if you, if, you, if you regard the whole world. But here, this one man, Paul, has made a, a difference because of the way he you know, took advantage of the strategic cities and the trade centers and even the logistics, the trade routes, the ship routes, everything established by the Roman Empire, as well as the language and the culture and the wisdom of the Greeks. So he rightly used it and that the time was right. And that one man's you know, uh, strategy changed the face of the gospel and, the, and, the, and you, what you call the evangelism of the world. From a Jewish faith to a predominantly Gentile faith. So the answer lies in the effectiveness of Paul's approach as a divinely chosen apostle to the Gentile. You know, Paul always said that. Um, you know, he was divinely, he was appointed by the Lord. You can see that in Galatians chapter 1, verse, uh, if you read from 1 to 6, you can see that the second verse says, you know, I, I was divinely appointed as an apostle. In verse 6, it says, in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 says, you know, this is not received from any man. I received from a revelation of the Lord Jesus. Verse 16 in, in chapter 1 says that, you know, it's actually a revelation by the Lord Jesus himself. So he was instrumental. There were other Gentiles who were con converted before Paul. And we know that there are many other Gentiles who were converted before Paul. But he was in instrumental in carrying the gospel to the Gentile lands. So he regarded his apostleship as a priestly service. This is one of the key sentences I want you to note. He regarded his apostleship as a priestly service. The offering of the Gentiles as an acceptable sacrifice which he desired to present to God. You find that this, this particular thing in Romans chapter 15 verse 16. The offering of the Gentiles. I don't have the gospel uh, with me today. I don't have uh, the, the, the book of the Bible with me. But you can take it and see that. You can see the offering of the Gentiles be pleasing to God. A sacrifice on I, 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 I will read it. I will read it. Yeah, please. please but, on, but on some points, I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given to me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that an offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Amen. So that, that was his whole concept. So he said that, you know, you know, you know, normally when we when you when we when you talk about sacrifices that is acceptable to God, you know, we always talk about, you know, the sacrifice that, you know, as a living sacrifice, you know, we give ourselves an acceptable, wholly acceptable, you know, pleasing and acceptable to the Lord. That is one sort of sacri sacrifice. There is another sacrifice where Gentiles are offered to the Lord, and that is also pleasing to God according to Paul. And that is a priestly service which Paul rendered and he encouraged his believers to you know, bring Gentiles to offer them to the Lord. So that was, uh, uh, I, I think, a, a, a wonderful way that you know, people used to present Gentiles as, a, as an offering to the Lord. So he also hoped that the Jews would one day see the blessings enjoyed by the Gentiles and envy them and eventually accept the gospel because which originally is their portion. So, you know, he always said, you know, wherever he went, the Jewish people rejected the gospel because of the orthodoxy, because of their, you know, their own, you know, his, they, their own, they, they had their own set of thought, that thought pattern and all that. They never accepted uh, what Paul said. Only a few people accepted and most, more of the Gentiles accepted. And we know that all the church established by Paul were predominantly, you know, Gentiles. And uh, he all, always had problems from the Jews. So he uh, literally had ju Judaizers, he called them Judaizers, who were always, you know, up to bring legalism into the church. But whatever said and done, 
he wanted them to literally envy how god is blessing the gentiles and let them see it he, what he said let them see it and eventually accept the gospel which was because it originally is their portion and it belonged to them so that is slide number next slide i want to say the gospel and the gentiles so according to bruce he said that you know many gentiles had an attachment to the jewish religion and their way of life and you can you see that cornelius and all those people they were actually they knew the jewish way of life many of them did know the jewish way of life and uh, you know their monotheism about one god the creator who was righteous and merciful who gave laws as a guidance guidance for righteous living but paul also had other gentiles who were idol worshipers they worshiped many gods with different standards of right and wrong laxity towards uh, moral standards etc so paul, paul had to deal with different types of gentiles some of the gentiles who were in close association with the jews probably they knew about what a what a you know single god or a monotheism was and uh, you know many of them knew about god being the creator but you know many others who were against uh, you know paul literally had to confront them to speak the truth about who god was and he spoke about the true god who is the creator god who gave them everything you know god is the one who is the source he is the one who supplies us everything for our enjoyment a god who never failed to live a witness in the world meaning wherever you know god you know in in, in whichever situation or you know in in the time the time frame of the, if you take the whole world's time frame and even the 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 time when god sent prophets it's all about you know being a living a witness in the world and ultimately he sent his son for man's salvation and you know who would be killed according to the you kill for the punishment of the sin of the mankind but shall be raised from the grave according to what is foretold by the prophets and then he would after that appear to many witness witnesses to prove this fact and he always said that god is offering the salvation to everyone who is putting their faith in his son jesus and you know salvation was not a foreign concept for gentiles moksha is also also you know it's found in uh, hindi it is found in puranas moksha is something you know uh, many people say enlightenment many people say salvation but salvation is a right word but gentiles were also seeking a release from their burden of guilt and fear of death this is found in every culture most of the cultures you will find this so salvation was not a foreign term so when when paul is offering salvation and you know they could immediately they could identify with the word salvation so paul was also bold in his message because uh, to offer them a crucified savior it was gruesome you know the, the 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 death on the cross was a gruesome death and it's a shameful form of death so in spite of the fact you know self respecting people would not accept a crucified savior because it is disgraceful to accept a crucified savior it would be folly for the greeks to believe in such a uh, they would say a, a man who failed in his mission but yet paul's preaching had crucified christ at the forefront and the hearers many of them accepted his message and found new life and experienced the very presence of god by his spirit this is what you know we find that lives transformed because of the very presence of god by his spirit you know they were able to accept the lord jesus they could experience the lord himself and this you know made a lot of different transformation in their own lives you know this was a uh, you know a, a testimony for you know the the watching world and they many of them accepted jesus and uh, the way of the, the crucified savior as paul put it so this was a more, more more of a new way of life so paul encouraged the new believers about this new way of living and how they could overcome the for, former lust which waged war against their souls and when the when he admonished uh, people um, the believers in the letters 
you know, he used many words like immoral, idolater, idol, idol, idolaters, adulterers, homosexual, thieves, greedy, drunkards, revilers, robbers to address their former way of living. So he had to teach them to submit and surrender their lives to the Lord and have him change and transform their lives to bring forth the fruit of the spirit in their lives to see them perfected. So Paul's whole intention was to see the believers being perfected, to see the, you know, gen the Gentile believers accept the Lord and bring forth the fruit of the spirit in their lives. So this was in contrast to teaching them the Mosaic laws to have them known the requirements of God. You know, Paul literally did not teach them the Mosaic laws. He did not go there with the Old Testament. Today, you know, uh, people try to, you know, we had a person in our church come to our church and literally I had to literally stop him from teach, uh, preaching because he was talking all about, you know, the Old Testament and the commandments of God. Literally, you know, his whole speech and his whole sermon was with the, the commandments of God. And I called him aside and said, Baba, I think we are both in different, two different directions. I don't want you to preach about this Ten Commandments anymore. He said, no, 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 this is what the, the gospel is all about. I said, please, I'm sorry. We'll say a full stop. You don't have to, I, don't, I will not allow you to preach in the church. Because it's full legalism about the, the, the commandments of God. And the entire sermon was about, you know, the first commandment, he would teach the preach the entire day. The second commandment, the third commandment, the fourth commandment. But here, it's all about receiving the Lord's spirit and the spirit who will transform us, not by learning the law. So this was what Paul's, uh, you know, his problem was because the, the people, the Judaizers would, you know, would work against him and you know they would try to bring in the laws they would bring uh, trying to bring in Moses and the laws and there's a question that could this teaching work in contrary situations especially in a place like Corinth which was an immoral city so he encouraged the new believers that they had to give an account before the Lord so he always in his letters would say that you have to give an account before the Lord so he treated them as mature sons of God. There is one aspect who had their hearts etched with the use. He always reminded them, you have the heart, you have your hearts etched with the law of the Lord. So instead of imposing the mosaic laws on them, he said, if you are in Christ, you have the law imprinted or the, the, the laws of the Lord in your heart. So he called for a higher standard, the law of Christ. 1 Corinthians 9, 21 which forbade Christians to have a disorderly lifestyle, quarrel with each other, or interfere with the affairs of other people. So he literally, you know, called for a, he called for a higher standard. So the essence of the commandments was based out of love, to love the Lord and to love man. So this is what he preached. And the power of the indwelling spirit who produces the character of Christ, which enabled the people to walk in love. So this was the core of his teaching. But in the, if, even though he had, you know, uh, you know we, we see that, you know, the way everything was simple and easy. It wasn't easy because it was not a cakewalk for Paul to teach the new believers. He had to encourage them. He had to admonish them, rebuke the believers to align themselves to the law of Christ. So he encouraged the believers to rise to the upward call of Christ and shine forth like bright lights in this dark world, ridden by sin and disorder. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10 to 14 says that. So the converts were, con the converts were constantly reminded to continue in the way of holiness. And you can see Paul spending long hours praying for them. As seen in Ephesians 1, 17 to 19, Philippians 1, 9 to 11, Colossians 1, 9 to 11, if you have seen that you know you can I, I can show you some of the passages i uh, I'll, I'll 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 try to take some of the passages uh for you can see ephesians chapter 1 17 to 19 let me take that it reads like this one second the, the eyes of the understanding might be enlightened to know the hope of their calling i'm just you know Paraphrasing and saying it, you know the hope of their calling, 
to know the inheritance they had that they have in Christ Jesus among the saints of God and to know the exceedingly great power that he wrought in Christ Jesus when he used him used the power to raise him from the dead so this is something that you know, Paul was always praying for the believers you know that in philippians he says that the love of god would abound in them and they would know they would know the discernment to to you know to know from the right from the wrong and all that so he there's always you know there was a constant you know struggle you know you would say agonizing in prayer all agonizing was to see the believers established so you know one of one of uh, paul's life's ambition was to pray for the believers and see them established and he was to pray specific prayers for establishing the believers in Christ Jesus so he had to fight on two fronts one was the liberal christians and the other group of people were the ascetic party who were advocating self denial so he had to agree with the liberals that christian living was freedom in christ but he said that it came with the responsibility it is not just a haywire you know uh, happy go lucky living it's a life that calls for taking up responsibility to the ascetic party who act, you know who were advocating self denial he clearly insisted that it could not be you cannot impose it on other people you cannot you know make it a legalistic religion because he himself practiced that legalism and he know that how much self denial you know he practiced self denial more than anybody else and he knew how much he could not change even because he practiced self denial so to one group he said liberty not license to the other group he said liberty not bondage and this is one i, I like this was very good bruce put it very well liberty not license and liberty not bondage so to the group two groups of people he had two slogans you can say and you can see that you know all the churches that paul established were in what do you say a pagan environment members of the jewish community community were circumcised they had the weekly sabbath they had clean and unclean foods they had special days of the calendar for you know worshiping the lord and all that but paul was against imposing this on the converts on the new converts so he always cited his is way of life as an example the word of the cross 1 corinthians chapter 1 was 18 to imitate paul as he imitated you know he always you know pointed to himself when he you know led a life as an example before the people so paul never wanted wanted them to severe ties with the gentile society this is very very important point that we should note paul never wanted them to severe ties with the gentile society especially you know the many of them had pagan wives or pagan husbands many of them had friends relatives or neighbors who were from the pagan background so you know they used to visit houses they used to you know get have get togethers which could include animals you know animal meat which was probably offered to an idol so he had to be sanctified and paul very specifically said in such cases you know sanctified by the word of thanksgiving so he encouraged people to you know be with the unbelievers that's one way you can share the gospel you now i'll give you an example in 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 our own church we had a pastor so i called the pastor's daughter to share the testimony i said you know sister i want you to come and share the testimony she is a pastor's daughter she this pastor is from a very very orthodox you know you can say ipc background so i asked the pastor you know he became because he saw the work that we are doing and he was impressed and he said i want to join your church i said pastor it will be difficult for you but nevertheless you can join there's no problem you can see how we, how we are functioning you can join so from ipc background he is coming and joining our church so this daughter is part of our church so i asked the daughter one sunday uh, I, you know i think before the service i asked her can you please share your testimony you know what she said pastor i am a Uh, i am a pastor's daughter i don't have a testimony i said i don't believe what you say. i i can't i i don't understand what you say sir pastor i am a pastor's daughter i've been a believer from my young young age uh, from a child i am a believer i don't have a testimony i said you're not a believer then 
she could she could not understand i tried to explain she never understood head or tail of what i said then i understood one thing i said do you have any uh, non believer friends she said she said no i said who do you move with you in, in your in your school i had I, i have a believer friend so what about the others we don't even speak to we don't even look at them this is the concept that the orthodox uh, what do you say the ipc people or ipc i don't know probably this pastor taught their children i don't know this is i'm the, i'm talking the absolute truth you know this is something that i have seen you know ex- one hand experience i'm 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 seeing this girl i told her what a you know a, a opportunity that you lost you had a, a, an opportunity because you are a seasoned believer right from the childhood you are a believer and you could have you know influence so many of your friends so many of your friends you could have influence she said no we would never used to even look at them they are su- supposed to be they were supp- we supposed we consider them as infidels or you know people who were unclean see how paul is you know dealing with that paul said i you know paul never wanted them to severe ties with the gentile people and especially you know paul specifically said if you are unbelieving husband or a wife if they want to stay let them stay if they want to leave please have the liberty to leave them but don't ever leave them on your own accord saying that you know we want to leave you paul specifically said this if you have if you are unbelieving husband or your wife is ready to stay with you let them stay in spite of you know there are, you know there could be you know problem where you know when they worship their probably if they go to their you know temple or something you know it it will be it will create some problems but in spite of that paul said you will be they will be sanctified because you are a believer and you know suppose uh, uh, food is served which is served to an idol you know have a prayer of thanksgiving that will sanctify the food so paul had very very clear idea about all you know how to deal with this this problems again you know but he was very specific regarding boundaries you know where christian need to know the limits especially uh, uh, in regard to la- rivalries uh, where you know sexual immorality was was uh, what was you know was, there was pagan worship and rivalries going on you know he had uh, you know very specific clear cut idea about uh, you know where to draw the line he said never partake in all that never have anything to do with all that he was very strict about all that but at the same time paul said you know be show extreme caution when you are with the political leaders you know obey the leaders obey the people in authority respect them and encourage them to obey them and to pay their taxes even that is due to the government so paul you know was very 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 you know cautious about all these things especially in regard to the the the, the way they obey the government and you know the people in authority the magistrates and you know paul was very very clear about all this and regarding the issues among believers paul was paul always encouraged them to settle the disputes within the church and not to approach courts and pagan judges that you can see in the letters of paul paul said please don't go to the pagan judges because church is above all that church is the god's community and you know don't you have believers who can settle small disputes within yourselves so this was a this was the concept that paul had never take your disputes to the pagan judges regarding other issues like you know when people were poor the wealthy believers were encouraged to take care of the needs of the less privileged ones which is also applic- ap- applicable between you know the rich churches and the poor churches paul always collected money for the poor people of the jerusalem church we know that and paul was also a proponent of unity and hospitality he always talked about unity in the church and hospitality among believers especially you know towards visiting members or visiting ministers or christians from other cities you know who used to come here you know take them as your own and you know he was very very you know clear about this about unity in the church and hospitality towards one another and you know each of paul's the, the established churches had a sense of belongingness 
so this is all you know a concept of house years you know today was i was talking to a uh, a, a group of believers you know i was telling that the sense of belongingness that was in false time because probably because they had the house churches today the sense of belongingness is lacking in big churches that is a truth if somebody is coming you know we wouldn't you know go out of the way and call them which was you know the the spirit of love and belongingness was so much you know prevailing in this first century church where you know the 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 because this is because the house churches were all you know small units where cohesiveness or you know belongingness was very very clear they were all you know in one spirit belonging to one another so this also gave them the covering and protection of the lord because they were within the community you know under the covering of the lord but rarely some offenders were asked to be excluded from the community you know paul used this word in one letter to deliver such an offender to satan so that they would come to their sense and return to the lord i i deliver such a person to satan you know many people you know ask me this question in the church pastor why is that how can you how can they you know get a believer excluded from the community but paul paul was very strict about all this especially you know when immorality was prevalent in the churches he said you know such a person should be thrown out from the church excluded from the community and let him know that when he is handed over to satan the he would be you know he would be out of the covering of the lord and he would be attacked by the evil forces and his life would be spared how he would accept he would come back to the lord so this was one way of you know showing belongingness in the community where they once in one part they had common meals and common worship in extreme cases they would be excluded from the community and as paul said handed over to satan and in paul's churches there was a there were you know there was a wide spectrum of believers from all classes that we all know that you know today is you know one of my friends is doing <clears throat> mission in in the tribal areas so he is against uh, mission in among the rich people i don't know some concept his concept is that his concept is that the, the, he takes a words word from um, matthew chapter 5 the poor they are the blessed ones who receive the gospel matthew chapter you know the beatitudes and he says that only the the gospel belongs to the poor so he works only among the tribals he said you know so giving the gospel to the rich is actually a luxury don't give it, don't give it to them it is only for the poor and the tribals that gospel is there but you know we don't see that in paul's life paul's life you know he had different classes of people they all coexisted in the church you know philemon is a slave owner you know that and you know he talks about the slaves and in to in colossians he says to the slaves and to the slave owners paul speaks to specifically to slave owners saying not to be proud and conceited there was an erastus who rose to the position of high official you know about the erastus when you if you have heard the word erastus you know he rose to a position of a high official gaius he had a large house to accommodate the church crispus was the synagogue ruler lydia was a business woman and you know talks about leading women of leading leading men of thessalonica and berea and you know acts chapters act uh, 17 and 4, 4 so all these influential people also were part of paul's ministry and many of these influential men and women became messengers of god's reconciliation uh, mercy to draw others into the community you know influential people can always you know jesus talks about the man of peace go to a place search for the man of peace so in the same way you know man of peace could be influential people who can become messengers of god's reconciliation to draw others into the community the second part of this this is understanding paul paul was you know as peter says there are certain things that paul writes which, which is very hard to understand and you know we say you know paul status are easy but they say in those days Paul's letters were very hard to understand. Second Peter three fifteen, he says, "Our brother Paul has written so many things which are some of which are very hard to understand, and we are at a disadvantage compared to the first recipients because 
they were well acquainted with the background of the letters we just we did not know what is the background so many of the letters are a reply to the letters written to paul example corinthian christians paul is writing to corinthians a reply you know they ask many questions about so many uh, their uh, uh, about doctrines and you know their lord supper there are the questions after questions so many of the things that paul writes in first corinthians is a reply to the letters written to paul by the believers and some other letters like second corinthians and philippians were originally two separate letters but later made into one so we have we have no clue about all this you know that's why you know the, we see different concepts and all that and paul also had the habit of dictating his letters so you can find gaps you can find you know intruding a new thought before closing a sentence or initial con concept you know you can see you know ideas crossing here and there and through all what you know paul has to say is relevant through all this is relevant in the first century as well as for the 20th, 20th century christians so it is relevant for us as well as to the first century christians so paul's letter is never out of date that is a, a speciality of paul's letters all what paul was you know he was trying to you know bring about the concept the doctrines as uh, you know we know that the first principles that were laid out by the apostles so paul is trying to bring that and to teach the believers what he was trying to intend the the whole intention was to make them mature and to establish the churches the 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 other thing that we need to understand is that many of the paul's letters were written prior to the gospel which many of us do not know many of paul's letters were written prior to the gospels the the two letters to the thessalonian church and probably even galatians were the oldest of the new testament doctrines or the new testament documents so when paul writes about the life death and resurrection of the jesus of jesus he is the one giving the earliest written evidence of jesus resurrection and death in first corinthians 11 Paul talks about the Lord's Supper, and uh, you, you should not understand that the gospel was not written when Paul taught his disciples. So the gospel was probably in an oral form or in the form of a story, probably which was communicated verbally. Paul's letters in Christian beginnings. It is rarely that Paul express quotes or expressly quotes the teachings of Jesus. You find you know paul uh, quoting jesus in a very, in a, in very very you know few places but certain places he does uh, express the teachings of jesus in first corinthians uh, chapter 7 verse 10 about divorce it's actually a, a teaching of jesus about the workers right to live by the gospel again a teaching of jesus lord supper which jesus instituted he teaches in 1123 about uh, believers who died who would rise at the second coming of christ again another teaching but very few places he had you know he taught uh, about the the doctrines of jesus about the the words of jesus but he mentions about the law of christ in first corinthians chapter 9 verse 11 which always is about uh, what jesus taught which means he never was against uh, that he was he never used it very often but in certain places he did he does uh, but he used in the word for that he used the word traditions so that's why you know paul in first corinthians chapter 11 was to talk paul talks about the traditions handed down by the forefathers or by the the previous people second text thessalonians he says hold on to the traditions which were taught by us again it says in second thessalonians 36 in accordance with the traditions so the new testament doctrines gradually appeared to put forth the writings and the you know you saw that uh, over the time the new testament doc, doc, documents were uh, you know they were slowly write, written by the apostles and other people and when we read that when we read the apostles and the acts we, we must this must be understood when we study paul because he teaches with authority which paul says that you know he received from the lord he says that i am teaching with authority because i received this from the lord that's why he you know forcefully teaches with authority 
and uh, we come to the end of the, uh, the 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 portion by bruce he said all the works of paul is endorsed by his fellow traveler luke so luke gives a clear record of the churches planted by paul we know that all, all what paul said all the letters to the the the, the churches is all recorded we can see this these churches the name of these churches are recorded in the the in the in the, in the book of acts so the book of acts gives us the timeline of paul's journeys also his sequence of his different journeys and the way he went about planting churches so we come to the end of this uh, the topic by uh, bruce so uh, the, the the entire thing is a gist of what paul taught and what uh he envisaged and you know he what he wanted to convey to the people is all recorded in the in the article written by bruce so thank you so much so uh, how would you fit this article into the idea of establishing uh, the concept of establishing that's important how would you fit this article into the concept of establishing i think this goes a little deeper than the previous okay can you explain like uh, explaining the law of christ and uh, like uh, basically they are uh, dealing with the real problems in, in the previous article is just the outline what jeff was giving here some examples because our competency is more on uh, discerning between uh, what is normative and what is cultural at that time So from here we will get some points on what are normative things we can do and probably some of the cultural aspects Paul was at this. Okay. Okay. Good. I feel that here Paul is dealing with specific issues. Okay. Very very specific issues, and uh, doctrinally he wanted. because probably because they they never had the gospels and the teachings of christ with them so he was very clear on many of the primary or the major issues or the major doctrinal issues that probably that you know they had a maybe you know difference of opinion on many of them they clue clues clueless about so many other things so so many things of the of the the doctrines that we now have as a bible so paul was uh, very clear about all that especially you know uh, about what he writes in the early letters like in galatians about it's all about it's not about uh, somebody teaching you it's about the revelation of christ it's one thing you know paul is very clear clear about it. it's not about what you learn from books it's not about what you hear from others it's not about you know what somebody has taught you it's about you know getting the direct revelation from christ so it's clear about so many aspects like that Okay. So what I what I see in this uh, article is we talk about in the previous article the idea of uh, Paul coming to a place preaching the gospel and then establishing the church. The establishing the church was done through the instruction that he gave them, the teaching that God gave them, uh, that uh, Paul gave them, and. as they were taught they were uh, you know dealt with the issues uh, that they faced in their environment the pagan environment that they were the background that they came from the habits that they had developed and how paul addressed these issues in the letters and personally with them or sending emissaries uh, on, on his behalf to teach them and uh, speak to them so the 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 idea of establishing was that paul used letters paul personally visited them and in the letters paul addressed different issues uh paul addressed doctrine in terms of uh, 
uh, how they what they need to believe in terms of uh, uh, not the law but grace uh, because there was a lot of uh, people coming in trying to destabilize the establishing process they were trying to unestablish the people there was a force that was working to unestablish the people and paul was trying to establish that so uh, this particular article you can quote left right center on different aspects because he talks a lot of aspects and uh, so if you see your mother deed that means your unit one if you can come to unit one <coughs> if you all of you open there and i'm going to give you some very interesting guides are you all there unit one okay so if issue one is under unit one paul's concept of establishing churches issue one is paul's concept of establishing churches issue two is the purpose of paul's letters in establishing churches uh three establishing a church today how would you establish that so if you see there is only two articles and the a article is repeated in the other two issue two and issue three has the same uh, jeff reads article okay now if you see biblical theology for issue two early letters middle letters letter letters so the assignment for us before we come next time is that we read all the letters because otherwise you won't be able to do biblical theology okay and the, and you see, see issue three there is no more uh, so technically you can start writing your competency because both the articles that is required has been finished what you need to do is the biblical theology read all early letters middle letters and trying to figure out from uh, jeff's article how these letters were placed and what was the central themes and how he built how he spoke to the early churches like this and then you know the churches that were you know that in the middle letters in terms of uh, giving a vision and mission to the church and how he uh, helped in establishing the house order and developing leadership in the latter letters so uh, if unless you read it you won't be able to and one of the exercises like we read the book of acts acts was 28 chapters okay 28 chapters we look so many letters and we get overwhelmed but you know what it's almost equivalent to reading the book of acts okay not significantly bigger so one of the exercises that we need to go through is reading the books of early letters and you should read it in that sequence so that you can see the flow how uh, what what actually god or the spirit of god was doing through paul in writing these letters in the sequence in this sequence the other thing that you need to do is start writing your competency there is nothing further work to be done what we are going to do next week is we will try and do the all the socratic questions okay and we will uh, uh, with that we should be uh, clear and uh, some of you can present your competency okay that will be the main work next week we will look at everyone's competency different people attempts i mean even if it's a skeleton no problem but put up your competency do a nice biblical theology do a nice uh, write up of uh, the establishing process and you know uh yeah sure i'll send that um, uh, it is there uh, 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 daisy you don't have the book with you huh? it is there in uh, issue 2 in the beginning it is there the early letters the middle letters and uh, Letter letters in schema. <clears throat> so, uh, if we are all able to spend time, one uh, over the next one week, fast read through the letters in sequence: early letters, middle letters, and this thing. Start putting up. The they are listed in that sequence, right? That yeah. uh, in the unit two, right? Yeah, unit two: Galatians, First Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, First Corinthians, Second Corinthians, Romans. Let's say early letters, so you can read through them. Uh, middle letters: uh, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and final one. That is very easy. That's very very small. Very six six chapters. You can finish it off. And of course, First and Second Timothy and Titus is also very very small. You have big ones are Corinthians and uh, Romans. Those are the only big ones. But please don't go to a, a very exegetical reading and things like that. It's a fast read. 
I am telling you. I think I lost you all. Huh? Josh, everybody can hear me? Yeah. 